Okay, and we're recording. Right, Brendan, I figured that out. <laughs> Thank you. I figured that out um, just as you were texting it. So I, so I figured out who was the host. Uh, and then apparently, just as I switched it around, I just signed myself out of the other one. Uh, apparently, the weekend haze was better than the current day. So here we go. Getting set up. Got one computer to record and the other computer to share the screen with. Yeah, all right, all right, people, come on. It's the end of the semester. I'm finally figuring technology out. Uh, okay, this week is not intended to be a lot. There should not be a lot you have to add to your course notes. There are two videos for Wednesday, but again, they're shorter videos. It's, um, woohoo, the camera is fixed. You all get to see my crazy hair again. Uh, you all will uh, have two videos, they're shorter. They're really just intended to show you, like kind of open your eyes to the world of statistics. Like last week, we, we looked at some models really briefly. Um, and this week we're gonna look at one new model but the new model is incredibly uh, dynamic. It's incredibly flexible. There's many options built into the one model. And so really what I try to do in this week's videos on Wednesdays is continue in this um, path to show you all what sort of world of statistics is now open to you with the tools we have covered in this class. And that's in fact what I'm gonna try to do today. Um, I really want today to be a course summary. There's a lot of different majors in this course. And it seems strange that you all get pushed into um, such a theoretical stats course. Um, as my last bullet point here on the uh, outline for today says, this course probably had less data than you expected. Um, and while that seems odd at first for a stats course, I really kind of believe in the idea behind the course. I really think this course, even though it was kind of crazy and chaotic, sets you all up well for whatever direction your specific discipline might take you within um, using the world of statistics. So since today is just a summary, you do not need to add it to your course notes. I will not mark you down if you do not add um, today to your course notes. I would like you to add Wednesday's videos to your course notes, but not Monday of this week. Um, is that clear enough? Hopefully so. Um, Okay, so let's see, other announcements before I get going. The final, uh, but there is no final exam, is Tuesday, May 18th. Unfortunately, at 8 a.m. I will be here, but I will probably look even more haggard and tired than I do this morning. Uh, at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, May 18th, uh, it's a two hour period. I will just use it as office hours. Um, and at the end of that final exam period is when all of your course notes and labs and tutorials are due. Your tutorials and course notes should be submit uh, through our shared Google Drive. I want you to upload both the R Markdown and the knitted HTML files um, for each of your tutorials and your course notes. And you'll also have to upload any files that uh, your course notes reference, like any images or plots or pictures or whatever you might have. Um, I'm going to let you all uh, email me this week to see that everything has uploaded correctly, but I am probably not going to have time to give you um, as full of feedback as I have previously, just because the same for you guys is the same for faculty as the semester draws to a close. There's kind of everything piled on your plate in a last minute rush to finish off the semester and you just run out of time to do things. So I encourage you to shoot me an email um, after you have uploaded your 
tutorials and course notes, even if they're incomplete, you can upload them again later, but you should at least upload them now to make sure that everything uploads correctly and you know how the process works. I am not going to be very sympathetic on Tuesday at 930 to people who are like, oh, I don't know how to upload things to Google Drive. Um, that's not the time to figure it out. The time to figure it out is now. Can you make a video on how to upload our course notes? Um, sure, I can make a video on that, uh, but it's really not too bad. Let's see if we can just do it now and include it in our course. Uh, okay, no, you know what? I have a bunch of emails from students and the only way I can get to those folders is through my email and I don't want that recorded because they're you know, private emails from students. So uh, Jake, sure. Uh, sometime later today, as I post all the videos, I will create a like one minute video that shows you how to upload your course notes. But it should literally be click on the link I sent you to your um, email from my at mail.csuchico.edu account. Uh, once that link opens, you should literally just drag the files to that browser tab and everything should work. Um, are there any other questions before I get going on a hopefully shorter than normal day where I'm just trying to wrap up the semester? Are there any questions before I get going? Okay, here we go. Course summary. This course was crazy, right? It's, um, it's a crazy new world of statistics that studies functions in a way you all probably have never really looked at functions before because these functions uh, start beginning to describe things you have not previously thought about or things you probably have not previously thought about. Some of us may have thought about these things before. But like even from the beginning of the class, we jump into distributions and distributions are really just functions that describe a pattern with which data can show up. Okay, so let's just write that down. This class talks about functions in crazy new ways. And the first functions we really started talking about were named distributions. And distributions are functions which describe common patterns of data. Like some data can only take on integer values. Some data can only take on non-negative values. And then there's these crazy new distributions like the normal distribution that doesn't actually commonly describe data itself, but it turns out the normal distribution, even though it doesn't describe data itself, it describes functions of the data of like, functions of data. So not only do we have functions that describe patterns of data, but then we have functions of data and we have functions to describe the patterns of the functions of data. This world, this world of statistics is just insane, but it turns out to be really cool. So we end up with things like the Bernoulli distribution, which only describes kind of one or zero data, binary data. We end up with binomial distributions, which is like an extension from the world of Bernoulli. We end up with gamma distributions, which is for data that can only take on non-negative values, often measuring time between events. And then somehow over here, connecting all of these distributions into one weird world is the normal distribution, which describes means from basically any distribution. So it's like you could have data from a Bernoulli distribution. And as long as you take your data and calculate a mean, 
that is some function of data. You add up all your data and divide by however many there are. Or if you have binomial data and you calculate a mean, or if you have gamma data and you calculate a mean, it doesn't matter really where the data come from as long as all the data come from the same distribution, then that mean of your random variables will in fact be a new random variable. And the pattern that describes, uh, I mean, the distribution that describes the pattern of means is the normal distribution. Does anybody re remember the name of that grand theorem that tells us means will follow the normal distribution? What is the name of that thing? The central limit theorem. Nice, very good. Central limit theorem tells us that means themselves are going to follow a pattern and that pattern is approximately normal. Okay, so this crazy world of statistics starts out with functions that describe patterns of data. And there's a lot of named patterns. And sometimes those named patterns, if you like group the data somehow, then the grouped data, the means themselves will follow new patterns. And it turns out that's like some of the most common uh, stuff we do with data is calculate means. And the reason we focus on means so much is because we know how the means themselves behave. We know the shape or the pattern of the means. There's not too many other functions of data that we know the shape or the pattern they follow. So we focus on means a lot. And focusing on means is actually incredibly helpful. because distributions tend to have some properties associated with them. And the properties are often defined through expectations. And these properties that distributions have are defined via expectations. And this is, I think, where the class started really kind of getting abstract because it wasn't too bad to say that data follows patterns and some of the patterns have names. Distributions are not the most abstract concept. They're actually quite tangible if you start looking at enough data. But the fact that distributions then have properties and these properties are defined via these crazy things named expectations started making the whole class a little bit harder. So I tried, but maybe wasn't super successful, um, though that's all a faculty member can ever do, is to describe some of these expectations by what they mean in terms of the distributions themselves. So the mean is a named expectation that actually tells us where most of the data are going to show up. When you think back to a normal distribution, the mean is actually the number right in the middle that tells us where most of the data are going to show up. Another way to think about the mean that we talked about was even if you don't have normal data, but say you have something like a gamma data, the mean is almost like a little, um, for you engineers, a fulcrum point. The mean is like a fulcrum point. Think of the mean as like the middle point of a scale. And the distribution sitting on top of the scale is going to balance out somewhere. Well, the mean is the point that balances out the scale. 
So if the mean is um, like, you know, centered right here, then the distribution will balance out right to that point. It'll take into account the really heavy bulk of the data over here and maybe the light tail over here off to the right. So the mean is where most of the data are going to show up, but there's a few different ways to think about it. But essentially, all it is is a property of a distribution defined through an expectation. We had other things like variances. We tried to draw pictures for the variance too that said something like the average width of the distribution. And we had things like percentiles. And the percentiles were, oops, that one wasn't very good. The percentiles were like some number down here that puts, you know, P percent of the data below that number. So we had these expectations that kind of defined all these properties of these different distributions. Now I tend to draw them with respect to the normal distribution because, well, in class, when I have a blackboard in front of me, I can draw a normal distribution pretty good, even if I can't draw it very well uh, on this makeshift whiteboard. So we started looking at these expectations to define properties of distributions, but uh, that wasn't super clear where data fits into this picture. So I tried early on to tell us that there was a, let me just make sure I got, yep. Yeah. That there was this overarching goal of statistics which is estimate expectations. I didn't phrase it like this, but now that we have the machinery, I can phrase it um, a little bit more. Uh, sophisticated and, and hopefully most of us will follow along. Estimate expectations from data. Instead, the way I phrased it previously was there was this world out there. There was this world that describes distributions. So you'd have data that would could theoretically show up like this, some sort of gamma distribution. And you'd want to learn about the patterns, the expectations that describe these distributions. So what you would do was randomly sample some data. And you would end up with like a vector of data like this or something, right? And so you would use these data to estimate expectations like the mean. And the way we would do that is through add up all the data and divide by however many there are. The mean, which we wrote in R like this, actually converges to, as your sample size, this capital letter N goes off to infinity, the true expectation of the random variable that describes the distribution from which your data came. So now this part of the class I think is, wasn't super abstract because I think you all are kind of okay with the idea of we can estimate some quantities, but it was a little tough because the quantities we are estimating are rather abstract. So I don't think you all are like, you know, particularly bothered by, you know, if you have a hundred data points, then you're gonna estimate something good. And if you have a million data points, you're gonna estimate it great. There were certainly some questions about where is the defining line between good and great, but um, we talked about how that's a rather difficult concept to answer. But I think the hardest part about this was that these expectations are still a little abstract in our minds.
But I think as long as we take away from this course that these expectations are properties of the distributions from which the data came, then we can really start wrapping our head around this broad world of statistics. And this is the point where I wanna to try to lead into the various majors that are enrolled in this semester's course right now. So for a lot of us in the world of statistics, we're like forced into this class by whatever major it is we're taking. And for a little bit, I'm gonna to talk to the engineers, but if someone else uh, wants me to pay particular attention to their major, then I'm happy to do it. So for the engineers, I think you all are forced into this more theoretical course than a data heavy course. Now remember uh, from early on in my slides, I said, uh, this class probably had less data than you expected. I think the reason for that, for the engineers in particular, is two sides. One, you guys are pretty mathematical from the get-go. So when we talk about many different functions in different contexts, we're not going to immediately lose um, basically anybody in this class. We won't immediately lose you, but we can bring the discussions to a new higher level than if this was a data-centric stats class. The data-centric stats classes rarely talk about what is actually being estimated, these expectations. So what I was trying to do in the class was give you a little bit of the data side. We looked at some data, mostly made up in R, so that you could get these understanding of these expectations, both in a sense of they are characteristics of distributions themselves, but also in the sense of we see that data is literally estimating these expectations. But we were able to look at both sides of this because you engineers and anybody else in the class are generally um, not scared off of high level mathematics early on. But I think the second reason that engineers are pushed into this class instead of data centric stats classes is because at this point, we can really start expanding our understanding of what statistics is doing in the class. I know it doesn't seem super obvious, but I really believe that at this point in the class, we can really start expanding what side of statistics you all might end up in in the future. So let me give a more concrete example than this kind of um, uh, rambling with no like specific point. So when I draw this arrow from a distribution to the data side, and I suggest there is this idea of randomly sampling data. In the world of the statistics major, randomly sampling data is its own course. This part right here, just randomly sampling data, is its own entire course. There's a whole semester just devoted to this. It's called Math 458. I'm not saying you all have to go run off and take math 458, but I'm suggesting, especially for the engineers, you might end up in a world where you need to understand more about the random sampling. And I'm really excited about this course because if you frame a course like math 458 about random sampling in terms of the distributions, then the class makes a whole lot more sense. So let me see if I can draw some more on my pictures here to give you an idea of why the random sampling class makes a whole lot more sense based on the topics we've learned so far in Math 350. So random sampling is all about discussions about how you can sample data from a distribution and obtain good estimates of the mean for the expectation. Now, what they often talk about is problems with sampling, like um, imagine the Amazon customer reviews for some product that you're interested in. If you've ever paid really close attention to Amazon customer reviews about specific products or really reviews about any products, 
When the reviews are voluntary, we suggest in the world of statistics that you're probably going to get very biased data. Now, biased data is hard to understand without a course like Math 350. But what it really means for Math 350 is you're probably going to get most of your data up here. And getting most of your data somewhere far away from the mean and far away from the bulk of the data is suggesting you're probably getting the refuse of people who feel very strongly about the product for not particularly good reasons. These are the people who would give, you know, negative 5 million stars to a product because as soon as they got it, it broke and they were really unhappy about that product breaking. You're often gonna get the extreme viewpoints from voluntary reviews. You're often going to get extreme viewpoints from voluntary reviews of products. That's gonna push you off into the tails. The tails of your data are gonna suggest that your mean is not going to estimate an expectation very well. Because if all you have is data in the tails, then you're not getting adequate representation from the bulk of the distribution. I think that's a discussion that's very hard to understand without a proper idea of distributions, which don't normally show up in other stats classes. Okay, so that was one uh, example of why I think this less data-centric, more math-heavy stats class is beneficial to basically any major in this class, but um, I tended to frame it as for the electrical engineers. I have one more example that I want to give kind of in this realm, but maybe I should like pause right now for a minute just to see if anybody's got any questions about my overview. I'm kind of wrapping the whole course up in like 15 minutes and that can be hard to, hard to handle since everything here is still so new. I'll do a forced water break. Okay, now y'all are like, keep going. Okay, towards the end of this class, oh. Yeah, um, statistics is heavily used in communication systems. I don't have any personal experience with it, but I know a good deal about this. Now, the problem is, it might not seem like the communication systems that you are thinking of. Chances are good you're thinking of like cell phones and you're thinking of like internet connections or maybe even you're going to like walkie talkies or radios or something like this. But when statistics get involved in communication systems, it's actually quite a bit closer to problems like, now here's why you're not gonna like this answer. Statistics in communications problems is actually quite a bit like problems uh, like this one. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so the bummer here is Communication is hard. Statistics plays a strong role in the world of communication, but I don't think it turns out to be communication about the way you're imagining it. Communication at a high level is all about how much information can be transferred in finite bits. Okay, I'm going to say that again, because that one takes a lot of understanding, including of the word bit, which happens to be defined on this page. Communication systems at a high level are actually about the transfer of information through noisy channels, 
That is channels where if you send a one, you don't always receive a one. Um, and sending information via finite bits. Finite bits. How does finite bits, bits come back into this? Let me show you how communication systems through finite bits comes back into this. The way communication systems get defined is there is a theoretical distribution, which is describing information to be obtained. There is a theoretical distribution describing information to be obtained, to be received. But what, gets, what happens is only a finite amount of information can be sent. The finite amount of information that is sent is represented as data. And now in that case, data is often ones and zeros. So you have a finite number of bits that are intended to describe things that only exist in limits. So it turns out to be a stats problem. How well can a finite mean, that is information of a finite number of bits, approximate an integral, an expectation, which is only defined in the limit as if your sample size went off to infinity. Stats is heavily used in communication systems to date. It, um, in the 50s and 60s, it started a whole new topic of the intersection between communication systems and statistics. It's called information theory. Information theory is an incredibly cool topic because it even stretches into the world of physics where it starts predicting, literally, it's, a, it's like a communication theory merge stats, which is now informing physics, uh, the world of physics, to say there's only so much information that can be contained in the world if you encode the world in bits. And that starts putting constraints on the way the world around us can operate. Oh, Nathaniel, that was a great question. But man, the answer is way longer than I can give. Oh, you know what I'll do? I'll post a book to a free book put out by this unfortunately deceased at a very young age physicist out of um, the United Kingdom. He wrote this fantastic book that mixes, he's a physicist, but it's a fantastic book that mixes stats, information theory, and how it plays important roles in what were his world of physics. I'll um, see if I can broadcast a link to that book uh, up on my webpage, on Discord, and on you, um, Piazza. That's the other one. Okay, great question. Uh, I got carried away in a tangent a little bit too, long, too far. Um, I'm going to now merge this back into why I think this class is particularly useful for you all, even though we didn't see too much data. And the reason goes like this. For a long time in this class, we set up the theory all around single um, variables. But towards the end of this class, we started looking at how to relate X and Y variables. We started looking at relating two or more variables. And it goes like this. There is theoretically a distribution that describes the relationship between some data. It's harder for me to draw a picture here. I'm going to draw some points. But over here, I want you to imagine an infinite number of points, just like as if there's a distribution describing the relationship between these two variables, x and y. Now, the same thing happens. You want to learn about properties of the distributions that describe the relationship between some variables. So what do we do in statistics? You randomly sample some data, but now you have data for the X variable and data for the Y variable. 
But that doesn't really bother us because in the end, there is still a mean to be taken and that mean is approximating an expectation. The only real difference now is you might have a conditional expectation suggesting that at different values of y, the mean itself might change. You now have a conditional expectation, which says at different values of y, the mean of x might change. At different values of y, the mean of x might change. That's super useful in the world of anything. Yeah, I don't even know how to qualify that because that's incredibly useful to all disciplines, which is why statistics is such a, okay, so when I say popular, I mean, you all have to take statistics. That doesn't mean you like statistics. It's a popular discipline. You all have to take statistics because we can relate. We can discover relationships between um, some variables, X and Y, through data alone. We can discover relationships through variables, X and Y, through data alone. And it happens to fit the same framework that we've been looking at in this class all semester long. We're essentially calculating means from data to estimate expectations, whether they're expectations conditioned on another variable or not. They are still just expectations that describe properties of distributions. Expectations are just describing properties of distributions. We want to understand what those properties are. The only way we can do so is through data. So in the last two weeks of this course, meaning last week and Wednesday's material, I'm starting to show you about the models that uh, statistics uses to represent the relationship between two or more variables. Last week and this Wednesday, I have short videos that start showing you all how statistics uses distributions to describe the relationship between two or more variable. I have videos showing you how statistics uses distributions to describe the relationship between two or more variables. And it fits into the framework of statistics that we're looking at. That's why this class is so crucial, I think, because whether you're going off to a class that talks, I mean, whether you're going off to a future discipline, a career that needs the understanding of random sampling, or it needs an understanding of a relationship between two or more variables. This class gives you the framework to understand how those relationships are showing up or the framework to understand why biased data is really bad and will end up uh, telling you lies. If you've ever heard about stats telling lies, it's generally because people don't understand the distribution side of uh, statistics well enough. So as my course recap, which I'm slowly ending here, is um, really trying to put the whole semester into a framework. I prefer a picture like this I'm hoping as the weeks went by, this framework is starting to make more and more sense. But um, even if it doesn't, I am optimistic that if you spent a good amount of time on your course notes, you can come back to these course notes in the future and understand a little bit more about whatever your future career in statistics has to do revolving around statistics. Uh, I think this class sets you all up very well for future endeavors in your own careers for the world of statistics. The only thing, and this is gonna be my last um, maybe two minute spiel here for the day. The only thing we haven't discussed, which is like, there is yet more ahead of you.
we have described in last week's videos, and we will continue on that page for this week's videos, conditional expectations that show up in forms like this. That is times, not an I. That is beta subscript one times some value of X. That's not beta subscript I, that's beta subscript one times some value of X. Topics not discussed in this class, which show up in um, second semesters like Math 351 or Math 450. So the way I have framed the course is we are estimating expectations, which means if this entire expectation is equal to some number like five, we are estimating that number five. What I have not discussed is how to estimate the components of the conditional expectation itself. There is an incredible world of machinery built up in order to estimate the components of these conditional expectations themselves. And in fact, you'll see through the videos this week, we just use functions like the function LM built into R to estimate these components themselves. But classes like Math 351, Math 450, or um, entire PhDs are built around estimating these components themselves. If you all are into this world of mathematical statistics, I highly encourage you to take Math 450 next semester. You've got to email Dr. Kathy Gray. About Math 450 next semester, because it studies a particularly cool a uh, sub-discipline of statistics that allows you to estimate these components of conditional expectations. It's called Bayesian statistics. Bayesian statistics is the entire discipline of my research, uh, my academic research. So I'm a really big proponent of that. I wish I could be teaching the course myself since it looks like we are all going back in person. Looks like, not guaranteed, uh, for the fall. But unfortunately, I'm on sabbatical next semester. So uh, I won't get to teach Math 450. But if you like this uh, future idea of how to estimate the components of conditional expectations that relate um, two variables to each other, like x and y, then I highly encourage Math 450. I'm going to quit here for the semester. You've got two videos to watch on Wednesday. Those Wednesday videos should be added to your course notes, but whether or not you add this course summary to your course notes is up to you. Um, thanks all for your time. I'll stick around for the next six minutes um, of class here if you have any follow-up questions. Otherwise, thanks for the semester. Um, have a good summer. <laughs>